Hey, welcome back to The Dive. Today on the show, we have the EVP of Global Sales from Swarmio Media. Tesh Kapadia is joining us. He's going to share his thoughts on Netflix getting involved with the gaming sector, the 2023 trends for gaming, and he's going to give us a company update on Swarmio from the rollout of the Ember platform in the MENA region, their recent partnerships, their strategy moving forward, and what investors can expect going into 2023. Hey Tesh, welcome back to The Dive. It's good to be here, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, now let's start off with some tech news. Netflix is getting into the gaming industry and has been announcing additional games regularly. Do you think it makes sense for streaming services such as Netflix to be involved in the gaming sector? Well, it doesn't surprise me. Here's the thing. Netflix revolutionized streaming in the way they did it. Um, and it makes sense that they're, you know, you got a $200 billion business. Why wouldn't you go after that? Uh, the other thing that Netflix has, you got to understand, they, they're, their content play, they've got a number of movies that are based on games. They've got a tight relationship with the publishing uh, houses type thing because they are actually, you know, they're actually streaming their particular content for the games. So it does make sense for them to be in this in this space. Now, the way they've actually engaged in the space, you know, we've got a difference of opinion on it, but that's okay. We, 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 we like their business model. And the other thing I love about Netflix being in the game is that because they did, they did what they did with streaming back in the day with all the operators and so on, and everyone was trying to put out the, their, their own digital stream, they took over the market, the whole all, all in type thing. I think this, this time it won't be exactly like that. Gamers are a very different sort of breed. Uh, I think that the content distribution of the, of the of the movies and so on that have to do with games, I think Netflix will have. I don't know if they'll they'll capture this uh, market holistically like they did with streaming, but I think they'll probably put a dent in there. And again, this this business is so big, this place for everybody in it. So I, you know, it's a good place for them to be. It's smart for them to be in that way. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how they roll their their gaming out. But I'm glad they did because now everyone else in the, in the industry is waking up to say, listen, we got to be part of that piece of the business as well. From your view, how has the pandemic changed gaming patterns? What areas of gaming have had the biggest growth? The pandemic holistically has, gaming has exploded because of the pandemic. It's one of the good things, you know, from a business perspective, the pandemic couldn't have been better for any other business rather than gaming type thing. If you're, if you're going to be sitting at home and you need some entertainment, uh, off you go. And again, we talk about it's the lowest per dollar value entertainment in the world. So it makes absolute sense. What it did do, you know, gaming did do is that the telecom operators and everyone else had to put in a whole lot more bandwidth and actually, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, make adjustments on their network side because everyone was gaming for what it's worth. Um, I think that you've got a lot of new people that came into gaming and esports. It's become, it's become known right through, but from a pandemic perspective, you know, the worst, first of all, the worse the weather is outside, the worse the, the, the economic climate is, the worse, anything that happens bad is actually good for gaming. It's the, it's the strangest thing. As we've gone through our business model with our customers and so on, we realize that whatever you would think for a typical business model, it's the exact opposite for gaming. So anything that's sort of negative on, on, a, on a geopolitical scale is good for gaming for what it's worth. What trends do you see in the gaming industry in 2023? First of all, you see the publishers that dominate the business as it, as it stands today. I think that you're going to see, you know, I, I'm, you're going to see many large companies fight for dominance in their particular jurisdictions. Um, we're lucky enough. We're going to be talking about a little later about our, our involvement in the Middle East, which is a, is a big is a big um, you know spot for us, a hot spot for us. But just to give you an idea of what's happening. You take a look at what's happening in Saudi Arabia, where they've announced, I think, thirty-eight billion plus dollars to be to be invested in gaming. We take a look at the same sort of thing in Qatar, the same sort of thing in the UAE. People are looking to dominate the MENA market. We take a look at, you know, the government in uh, in the UK just announced tax breaks and so on for gaming companies and so on. People are trying to attract gaming companies. They're trying to get be part of the whole ecosystem. They're trying, you know, the Olympics is going to put in, you know, esports is going to be part of that as well. I think you've just seen everyone wake up and say, hold on a second. We not only want to be part of that, we want to dominate that. And you're going to see, you're going to see the market leaders in, in each jurisdiction come together. And you're going to see players that you normally wouldn't have seen before throw a lot of money, a lot of effort, and, and a lot of time into actually figuring out how to bring this thing together. So we're, we're excited. We seem to be, we, I think we're, we're finally in the right place at the right time. But market-wise, I think you're going to see some big names that you wouldn't think of 
that want to be part of, of, the, of the gaming ecosystem as we see today. People are seeing it as a real business. Before people used to say, oh, that's something that, you know, kids did. Now they're seeing, now, now, the, now, now Forbes and everyone else, all businesses are looking at gaming and esports when they see the numbers now, they're starting to understand it. And they say, hey, listen, we want to be part of that. Let's talk a little bit more about Swarmio. You announced a partnership with ET Salon UAE, known as EANT. Can you walk us through the partnership and what does this mean for both parties? We are we are so happy with the partnership for, for with ET Salon. Um, you know, ET Salon, I don't know if you know, you know, let me just take check my numbers because they are, I wanna I wanna make sure I do them justice type thing. ET Slot's got about 162 million subscribers throughout the region type thing, you know, and that's all their properties. So people don't realize, especially in North America, they don't realize how big they are. Um, they, uh, they, they recently branded to EN. Um, they are by far, they're, they're temp, you know, I think they're just under 10%, but they are, they they are the, they are the largest shareholder in Vodafone as well. Um, uh, and they are the, if you were to think that they're the gold standard when it comes to telcos, their branding and their name is far, far away. I think they got the award for many, many years in a row. Of, of one of the best sort of marketed companies in the world that, you know, like the, they're like a Coca-Cola of, of telcos for what it's worth. So we're very, very happy to launch with them. And we're launching with them in the UAE with an expansion into the MENA region. And I think that the, uh, the regional sort of uh, our first phase is, is to address about a, a gaming population of about 84 million, 85 million gamers. That's, that's the population that we're addressing. Um, it is, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how happy we are about that. Uh, about that, one of the cool things is that you know the MENA region right now. I think it's it's at a one point seven eight or one point eight billion dollars sort of business type thing. It's going to be moving to to, to twenty twenty five to about a five billion dollar year business. This is why uh, the 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 region itself is spending so much money competing with each other. And uh, you know, if I could say this, um, you know, oh, another interesting uh, fact about the UAEs where we're launching, nine out of ten people have described themselves as gamers. Now think about that, that's 90% of the population. Only you think it's, you know, it's, it's 20, 30%. And I was just in Dubai just a, a few weeks ago and, and, and it was winter time, so it was really nice weather for what it's worth. But when you, when, you, when you take a look at the Middle East and you just take a look at the three, four months of the year where it's summertime, where it's unbearable, you, you, people don't go outside and I can understand why. You can understand why gaming becomes such a, you know, such a pastime where, where, where it's so popular. The other thing, not to not to be too long winded about it, what we realize is not, a we have a great opportunity. We love we love the fact that we're working with Itasan. I think there's a lot of strategic things that are going to go back and forth between us. I think you're going to see further announcements down the road. But when you take a look at the MENA region from a regional perspective, everyone's fighting over it. The one thing it is, it's underserved. And and here's the thing: demographically, you cannot think of richer nations in the world than the Saudi, Qatar, uh, you know, UAE, and and the and the rest of the region, Bahrain, and so on. The the whole region is economically, it's it's very very powerful. But from a gaming perspective, the publishers and everyone else, and and I'm generalizing a little bit, they've forgotten about the Middle East. If you take a look at all the pro, uh, you know, the sort of pro circuits and so on, the Middle East is under 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 underserved. It's, it's under it's underrepresented. So you don't see the top players coming out of the Middle East actually competing on the world stage because they are because of, because of that. We also know where all the game servers are and all that kind of good stuff. So us bringing this to the to the MENA market is 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 something special. And I'll tell you what we you know we couldn't have done it. Uh, we could have been happier with the, with the partner that uh, like he just thought to take it to market with. So. Tesh, could you give our audience a quick overview of what the Ember platform is? Sure. It's, you know what, this is our engagement platform. We've got a lot of technologies around Ember, but Ember is where, where, where the customers or the end users come to play. Uh, it's where they actually post their scores. We have all our tournaments there. We have our challenges there. We have our, our, um, you know, our, um, influencers come on in and, and we, we host their items in there. We host all our content to that. This is where the streaming happenings. This is the hub. This is the gaming core. This is where the engagement actually happens. That's the Ember part of our platform. And then that ties into our pay in store and everything else. But Ember, to net it out, is where we actually do our, our, our end customer, our user engagement, if you want to think of it that way. We've seen a lot of partnerships and agreements this year. Do you care to share your strategy moving forward? And where will the revenue growth be coming from? Yeah, the, you know, what we're very excited is a few things. First of all, you know, we talked about the Eta Slot partnership. The other one is the Unipin partnership that we had. 
um, that gives us access to, you know, uh, content at, at, at a significant uh, sort of size and level. You know, you know, companies like Unipin do hundreds of millions of dollars per month in business and, and, and they're partnered with us. Uh, we'll talk about how, how that impacts our store piece. Um, the, the, the telco partnerships that we have in the region, we've just, we're, I'm going to say it now, we're going to be announcing that we, we've, uh, we've integrated with Gcash in the Philippines at 66 million subscribers. Um, and we're partnering with operators all around the world. One of the things that we've done is we've hit a nerve with the end customer, um, which we talked about a little bit is saying that we found something that they like. We found a situation where, you know, our growth is, you know, upwards of uh, 30% month over month. We're looking at um, numbers such as, you know, uh, for, for the people that are coming into the platform, uh, you know, the people that are hitting our landing page, you know, 18% of them are actually making accounts. We're seeing of those people that are making accounts, we're seeing about four, north of 4% is actually, you know, um, you know, uh, spending money with us. And here's what's surprising. For those who are spending money with us, we're seeing spends in certain, in, in certain jurisdictions upwards of $50 plus per user. And if you take, wow. you know, let's take a look at the overall business, 10 to 15, you know, 10 to $15 ARPU, I'm coming in with a $50 override on that. This is significant. We've done a few things that are, that are, that are amazing. We've, A, we've, um, we've been, we, we put the telcos in a position where they're, they're making a, uh, they're, they're making, they're, they're making impact on the gaming side of the house. B, uh, you know, we, we've touched the nerve with the end customer and C, which is the most important, we've just become sweetheart of all the publishers because now we're showing them that our business model works and the monetization model works, and we are actually giving them access to markets they didn't have access to before. So everything is sort of working really well. You know, we, we've been with some bumps around the road, but I think we found that magic formula where we fit in, and everyone seems to be a win-win-win situation, so we're really, really happy moving forward right now. Okay, very exciting. So before we let you go here, for our investors watching, what are the key metrics you're focused on and what should investors be looking out for with Swarmio near term? Yeah, um, you know, it's a good question. Um, now I gotta watch what I can and can't give away. I think that, you know, as we take a look at the, you know, when we take a look at the majority of revenue in this entire gaming industry is made by the publishers. I think it's important to note that Swarmio is now, you know, we're, we're working with, with the likes of Tencent, you know, and to give you an idea, you know, when Tencent, I, I picked the, the biggest one in, in, in the region type thing. But I think Tencent, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, give or take, the markets go up and down so much. They got a market cap just under $400 billion now. They were up at $900 billion, so almost a trillion dollars during the, when the market was at its peak just a little while ago. But, you know, we're dealing with the people, we're dealing with people like this. We're, the publishers are seeing that, listen, I'm bringing them to markets they didn't have access to. I'm giving them access to customers they wouldn't necessarily have. We're bringing the telcos into play, which are, which are um, what's the right way to say it? Which are credible partners to be with, right? So when the, when the publishers are looking at this, they're saying, listen, these are credible partners. These are places where, you know, I want my brand to be associated with. This is very, very important. The, 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 uh, the telcos out there, when we take a look at the likes of Edislot, which is the gold standard, we take a look at Globe, and we take a look at Oridu, we're taking a look at some of the, some of the largest operators in the world that trust me with their brand. When you marry all this together and we're able to provide the managed services and do what we do really, really well, which is that engagement factor, which is to bring the, you know, to tap into the demographic that is so tough to tap, tap into and successfully do it. I think there's some interesting things that are happening. And I think that the scale at which people will see things is going to be much different. I think, I believe that, you know, our CEO in, in the coming months will probably give you future, you know, uh, you know, guidance looking future, uh, uh, future looking guidance. I figured all the hard work that's been gone in for the last, you know, X number of years is now starting to pay off. So we're, we're very happy with the way things are moving where with, with the partners that we have with, with, with how the market is looking up, looking at us, not only from a telco side of the house, not only from the consumer, but the publisher side of the house. And, and they're realizing that this model works and they're actually entrusting us with it because it, 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 it it's going well. I think that forward looking, you're going to see something special coming out of Swarmy. I think, I believe that uh, in my heart that this will be the breakout year for Swarmy. Oh, wow. Lots of big things to come from Swarmio. Okay, Tesh. Well, that's all we have for you today. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, giving us the company update. We'll see you in the new year. Bye. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We'll be back again tomorrow with the latest news in the small cap world. So stay tuned by hitting that bell and subscribing below before you leave us. Bye.